So uh, welcome everybody. It's um, good afternoon to us in the UK and obviously good morning over to US where Professor Dodman is based. So I'm really thrilled to introduce Professor Nicholas Dodman, who is an Emeritus Professor at the Tufts University in the US, and he will be talking to us today about the fact that dogs are far more like us than we actually think, or canine psychiatry in action. So uh, I'll hand over to you now and really looking forward to the presentation. All right, thank you. Eva. Um, so it's true, it's been the story of my life with not thinking that um, animals were very much different from us. I had a mother who was very empathetic to all animals, and she was like the neighborhood St. Prince of Assisi. And everyone would bring their you know, birds and you know, just come out of a nest or other animals are in trouble to bring them to the house. And we'd sit there on the floor and nurse them. And I never imagined for a minute that they didn't have feelings and emotions and could feel pain and things which have been subject to debate uh, since I was a kid. You know, even like, do animals feel pain? We don't know. Well, we do know and they do. And it's just exactly what I thought when I was a kid. And I went to veterinary school, skipping a few years, and a lot of people say, oh, you're a vet, so it must be such a difficult course because a human doctor only has to learn one animal, and you have to learn all these different animals. The fact is that they teach you a common theme. So, for example, a four-chambered heart, like we have, is the same as the four-chambered heart that the dog has, which is the same as the four-chambered heart that the cat has. And all of the dynamics and the flows in and out are exactly the same. So you don't have to learn it for each one. You just transfer the knowledge. I mean, a joint, you know, elbow joint is the same from species to species. The kidneys are the same, the liver is the same. And it's no surprise, we do think, and all vets just think that, you know, all the systems are the same, like we get the same diseases. And that came as a big surprise to this wonderful woman, Barbara Nelson Horowitz, who is a human cardiologist. When she was called in to see a primate, and I believe it was a, a gorilla, um, at the San Diego Zoo, and, and they said, you know, this, this animal in heart failure, and I was wondering if you could just come and have a look at it. But to her, it was a complete revelation. She's like, oh my goodness, the heart is the same. It's working the same. The pressures are the same. Uh, and, and then as she learned more, oh, and the kidneys are the same, and the liver's the same, and the muscles are the same. And, and she said, you know what, I'm going to write a book. So she wrote this book called Zubiquity, which started a movement of animals and people being the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, our bodies are the same. But what she wasn't thinking about was the mind. She was thinking about the physical thing, which all vets would have automatically assumed that would be the case. So I was more interested in the mind um, because of my former career, I mean, early veterinary career, I was a veterinary anesthesiologist, sort of board certified in that specialty. We had to learn about the brain. We had to learn about the brain structures and the various centers. And you know, the picture on the left is sort of you know, diagrammatic representation of the neurons talking to each other. Well, in the anatomy of the brain, it's pretty much the same. I mean, you could they, dogs and people and cats and horses have the same brain structures and the same sort of nodes or you know, communicating centers. Um, they have the cerebral cortex, they have a, you know, the old reptilian brain, the basal ganglia and such like, they have the same brain stem, they have the same respiratory centers, they have the same neurotransmitters, they respond to the same anesthetics, and so it's the same. I was more interested in, um, you know, when they're asleep, they're asleep, but I was more interested in them being less anxious when they went in for surgery and less painful and most anxious when they woke up. So I was very interested in modifying how they feel using what else? Human medicine. And as I got further into it, um, it's a long story, but uh, I eventually became interested in all of the various things that go on in the brain and the conditions that are very much like 
hearing condition. And I put a list of them there from anxiety to attention deficit disorder at the bottom. Um, any of these things, you know, like PTSD. I think I was the first person to actually have a case presented to me. And it was quite obvious that it was PTSD. Um, the animal had had terrible of trauma, actually was shot. And, you know, it woke up with a change of personality. It became hypervigilant. It couldn't sleep at night. It was constantly avoiding um, any circumstances that were sim similar to the stress inducing event, which was being shot and seeing a policeman in uniform and flashing lights and such like. So, you know, I wrote it up as PTSD, I think, in my first book, um, The Dog Who Loved Too Much. So, there are all these conditions which I studied more in depth as life went on. I can't go through them all in the time I have, but I thought I'd concentrate on just two, um, which have been uh, quite a focus recently. And the first one is obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, there are people who are like the old school who would not want me to put the word obsessive in front of compulsive. So the purists would say canine compulsive disorder. Because they say, how can you tell that the dog obsesses? Well, they look to all the world like they're to all the world like they're obsessing, and uh, they engage in the compulsion. So I don't see why not. I mean, if you try and stop them in the middle of this thing, they become very stressed and okay, anxious. And the studies of this compulsive disorder led me into a sort of fortuitous discovery of canine autism in one dog breed, the bull terrier. And I'd like to go through these two specific uh, types right now, and just to show you the kind of in-depth diet that we did. Now, first of all, obsessive compulsive disorder. This is the cycle from uh, the OCD help website. And where do you break into that circle? Well, almost anywhere. Um, but usually, um, uh, anxiety it might be the beginning point. You, you are anxious. Um, the horse is anxious, being stuck in a stall 24 hours a day. Um, the dog is anxious, not getting a proper life. And so they start to engage in a behavior that brings them some relief. And they do it. The relief um, is temporary. And then they start to think. That's the obsession is the thinking part. And get anxious until they perform the compulsion again. And it's a cycle. It goes round and round and round, unless you interrupt it. So people didn't think of these repetitive disorders. Um, young humans, it would be hand washing, for example. But actually, it applies across all species. They all have um, compulsive disorders. I mean, humans do ones that are similar to their own, you know, biological tendencies. You know, we're in hunter gatherers, and you know, we're not boring in the details. You know, think of something where people gather things compulsively, and I mean completely out of the ordinary way. A hoarder is a kind of compulsive disorder. But well, elephants um, don't do that, but they do walk. And this element is the typical element in a you know, enclosed environment with a chain around its foot. They can't go anywhere. So what they do is they walk in place. So the legs, all four of them move like they're walking, but they're walking in place. And just like when the elephant's walking, their heads sway from side to side, they do this head swaying movement. The big cats are used to running around in the savannah um, in an enclosure like this. They run around in circles and make grooves in the edge. If they stop doing it, they're subjected to the anxiety that they feel in confinement. When they do this, it brings them some relief. They might lie down again, but then they do it again. So this is the cycle in action. For dogs, these are the common compulsive disorders. Acral lick dermatitis was formerly known as lick granuloma, and vets didn't know how to treat that for such a long time. And they were always, you know, if there's a, a lesion, a scar, an ulcer on, oftentimes starting on the left front paw, could be on a hind paw too. And they started treating it topically with antibiotics and anti inflammatories and stuff like that. Um, in fact, that problem has now been shown to start in the brain with a compulsion that goes on and on and on, and it can be reduced by uh, human anti-obsessional drugs. There's one that I'm going to talk about in, about in some detail, which is um, flank um, and or blanket sucking, which is pretty specific for the Doberman breed. Tail chasing, 
which is what got me into the autism, which we're going to talk about. Other ones are you know, running in geometric patterns, chasing lights and shadows and fly snapping. And a lot of them, like I said, with the human ones, the human OCDs, are derived from natural behaviors. So dogs do, do dogs naturally groom? Is that in their you know, hardwired repertoire? Yes. Um, when their babies do they suckle on their mother when she's nursing them? Yes. Um, are they a predatory species? Is that how they live? Yes. So you would expect all these to present in that way. I wrote it all about, about it all in this book, which um, I hear some people have read, Pets on the Couch. Uh, they diluted it a bit by making me tell all kinds of funny stories in between the serious science. But just to say that in humans, the prevalence of compulsive disorder is approximately 2.5% of the global population. In dogs, it's been assessed between 2 and 5%. Um, um, and there's just a picture of a lit granula. I want to show you that is on the left paw. And I think you can see that dog is anxious. Looks anxious to me. I think the real, uh, the first step at bringing human and, and animal OCD together, the parallel, was by a very clever woman, Dr. Judith Rappaport, who was the head of child psychiatry at the National Institutes of Mental Health. And she wrote a book called The Boy Who Could Not Stop Washing, which was about a boy with OCD. And she did a national tour. She reached the New York Times bestseller list. But when she got home, there were all these telephone messages saying, hey, what you just talked about in your book and on television, my kid does that or I do that. Uh, and my dog does it. And she was interested in the dog does that. The dog does that. She thought, I wonder, which is the clever part. She said, I know, and she developed this. She's, she's kind of like the iron lady of rock tight science. So she did a paper where she took a lot of these often large breed dogs with a lit granuloma, and she treated them with a couple of anti-obsessional drugs and a kind of blank. Um, and they all responded. Not only did they respond, they responded down exactly the same time course as humans. So she published in the 1990s that the dog um, lick granuloma was not only looked like, but actually responded to the same drugs as human OCD, hand washing, same thing. So onto my Dobermans. There they are, there's a little puppy. Some litters of Dobermans are born with 70% of flank and blanket sucking dogs. Um, there are some other breeds, um, a lot of some German breeds, uh, Dachshund, Weimaraner, maybe there's some common genes there. It's thought to be related. I said suckling behavior, that's really the, that's the right word. I, I used to say uh, nursing, but nursing is what the mum does and suckling is what the baby does. And it involves repetitive mouthing and sucking of the flank region or, or sometimes just a blanket that's lying in front of them. And sometimes there's ingestion, um, eating of bits of things too that goes along with it. Um, we published that in that paper reference at the bottom. Um, so a kind of pica, which means depraved appetite, goes along with this condition. There's a stationary picture of a Doberman engaged in this nursing and you'll see that they well, I'll show you in a movie looking a bit anxious turns around and then eventually gets his big mouth around his flank and goes into this suckling mode and his eyes kind of roll up into his head just like he's drinking from mum's mammary gland. And it's pretty bizarre. Look at that sort of far away look. He's almost, you know, almost drugged, but not. So we, knowing how powerfully genetic it was, we started to look at the genetics of um, this, this particular model, because when you're doing genetics, you're supposed to stay in the same breed and it's a long story, but we did a study looking at Dobermans that did and Dobermans that didn't have the flank sucking. And working with the Broad Institute, um, Eleanor Carlson and my colleague, Dr. Moon, um, we published a paper that showed 
we found that the glitch that causes the Doberman to flank suck is on canine chromosome seven. And fortunately for us, in that region that we identified, there was only one large gene, which is called a CDH2 or neural cadherin. A neural cadherin had some implications too, because when you look at the gene, and what it does and the pathway downstream for the proteins that produce, it led us to think about the mechanism and what might be used in treatment and that turned out to be right also. Moving on to tail chasing and spinning, um, a lot of these are very predatory dogs, um, terriers, herding breeds, because herding is derived from predatory behavior, but any breed can be affected. Um, some of them injure themselves, um, one German Shepherd bit its tail off and brought to the vet and the vet bandaged that said, I'll do the surgery tomorrow morning. But when she went down the next morning, the dog had bled to death in the cage. So it can be very serious, even life threatening. And if you try and stop them in the middle of this, they become very agitated and they can't even become aggressive. So it's you're stopping them from engaging in this thing that brings them relief. and They don't understand it. So there it is, in, basically, it's a repetitive disorder, chasing the tail. Um, like all OCDs, it does not serve any true purpose to um, engage in it at that level. It's an abnormal uh, response to some environmental stimulation, you know, maybe people coming or going from the house. It, it is time consuming in humans, you know, because there is a spectrum of compulsion um, they to, to define it in the Diagnostic Manual of Psychiatry, they say for humans it should take at least um, an hour a day. Um, but some of them don't. So, for example, pyromania, humans setting fire to buildings. I mean, they may only have to thought once a month and go and set fire to something. So they're not doing it for an hour a day. That would be pretty crazy. But, you know, it's just for the regular, you know, conventional uh, obsessive compulsive, they say an hour. We found out that it does disrupt owner relationships uh, with the dog. It interferes with daily life. Um, injuries are definitely possible, like I just said, and some of them sadly end up by being um, euthanized. Uh, but very sad stories about that, but in the interest of time, I'll speed on. Here is a picture of a bull terrier in my office. And he went around and around and around. And actually, I hadn't realized it at the time, but so do autistic children. Um, I don't have the video now, I've got it somewhere on my computer, but they will spin around and around and around with their hands out. Um, their hands are out to the side like a little helicopter and they go around and around, or they engage in other repetitive disorders. So that kind of goes along with autism. That hadn't occurred to me at this time until we wrote this paper. And this was um, about 333 bull, well, 333 bull terriers. Approximately half of them had tail chasing and half of them didn't. And we noticed that riding along with it, when we came to look at the control group, the unaffected and the affected, that the affected dogs statistically and significantly had certain other behaviors that traveled along with this repetitive disorder. And one of them was trance-like behavior. Another one was occasional explosive aggression, particularly in males. Um, males were in fact at a greater risk of tail chasing, which means there's some kind of sex difference. And they also were prone to phobias that all went together. And then we thought, hmm, behavioral conditions like that in humans, because of the parallels that we're talking about today, humans are socially withdrawn, autistic children typically. I mean, there's a spectrum, right, from seriously affected, you know, almost uh, just rocking in a chair, right up to the other end of the spectrum where you've got the, um, you know, really high functioning autistics who are perfectly capable of sometimes wonderful things, the savants like Rain Man, um, they, they have tantrums, so do the dogs. They have hyperactivity, so do the dogs. They're inattentive to everything around them apart from what they're doing. 
they can become obsessed with objects. So that bull terrier I showed you was going around in circles. If you produced tennis balls and put them on the ground, he'd become obsessed with the tennis balls. If you took the tennis balls away, he'd start to run in circles. So he had the object obsession too. So the, the, the kids have spinning hand flapping, which I mentioned before. They're also sensitive to noise as are the dogs and they also have phobias. So we wrote in that paper, you know, this has very many similarities to autism in people. We did a post hoc study on our group because we were so, we thought it really does look like it. And so we took a smaller number of dogs, people who responded a second time to another. And we found out that highly significantly, the dogs that engaged in the um, compulsive tail chasing were more withdrawn and less, less interacted with people, you know, not making eye contact, same as autism. That was something we hadn't looked at in the paper. That was the after the gold rush type thing. And do they have a greater object obsession? The children? Oh, yes. That was the picture of the ch child with the, the blocks. And do they have greater noise sensitivity? Yes, the owners said, highly significant. So we submitted this paper to um, a journal. I think this is the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. But that journal was too clinical and they turned us down and, and they said, what we need from you in order to make this really rock tight is a biomarker. That is something in the, that travels in the blood that's you know, sort of rather than just looks like, just appearance, we need something tangible. So we went back to the drawing board and we found the tangible thing. But in the meantime, let me just show you this picture of trancing. They go into a trance. They usually go under a bush, kinds of Christmas tree. They go into slow motion, what I call moonwalking. When things are over in a dog, they shake. The end, of, the end of that episode, you'll see. It. Shake. Okay, he's through the trancing. And actually, that trancing is um, probably caused by seizure, which is also. 25% of autistics have seizures. So here was the biomarker. Um, I worked with Dr. Theo Herodes, who's a, an autism expert at Tufts Medical School. And we measured um, something that he knew already was elevated in autistic children was a polypeptide called neurotensin on the left. And this is... Um, just a kind of box plot arrangement on the right. But you can see the dots on the left are all lower down than the dots on the right, and the difference is significant. So the affected bull terriers had higher neurotensin levels, and using a similar statistical um, method of showing it, we also showed they have higher levels of corticotrophin releasing hormone, which is also elevated. So these were two biomarkers, both elevated in the affected dogs. Then we moved on to genetics. And I think you'll see on the right-hand side, this is what's called a Manhattan plot. And along the bottom line is all the chromosomes, so number one, number two, number three, number four, all the way up to, at the far end, that very tall spike in purple um, that is on the X chromosome. There's something on X, and if you go to the other end, in purple, there's something on chromosome 4 that looks suspicious as, as approaching some kind of significance. I can't tell you the end of this story because this is still ongoing at NIH under the, uh, it will be the next part of a study, actually sort of ongoing collecting cases, more cases, um, at, uh, with Dr. Elaine Ostrander and her skilled um, assistant. But the, the ratio of male to female for our autistic dogs was five to four. The ratio in humans is seven to one. So what is the ratio for this fragile X syndrome, which is the only you know, genetically known cause of autism? It's the only gene that's... And fragile X is a, you know, an X, X chromosome problem. 
and the physical features, as well as these being, you know, described as autistic. You know, there's a the spectrum of autism, but the the ten percent that have fragile X, they have large ears. Look at the bull terrier. They have a long face. Look at the bull terrier. They have soft skin and a high arch palate, which the bull terrier has because of the breeding. They bred specifically for this big Roman nose. So we think it could be um, a human model of Fragile X. And the bottom line is everything that we've ever looked at in this detail from OCD to autism to what might be Fragile X, everything um, pans out exactly. These are brain things. Uh, treatments are what a psychiatrist would do for a person. And here's some treatments that have been used in people that also work in animals. SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac. And that is a first line treatment for tail chasing in dogs. Same treatment. Um, because some are associated like the ones, humans with autism that have um, convulsions or partial seizures, they're treated with anticonvulsions of arsons. So are the dogs. Um, we haven't done much work with luteolin, which is a flavonoid, kind of yellow. You know, all those vegetables up there would be loaded with flavonoids. Um, luteolin is one that Dr. Theo Herides identified, and he had a wonderful um, film of an autistic child who could not speak. And after two years with luteolin in the diet, he ended up by speaking again. And he said, I would like to thank Dr. Theo for making it possible for me to communicate. It was really quite dramatic. And also Theo Herides is very interested in an E-number free diet. So E-numbers, you can look it up, a whole bunch of things, mainly, you know, the things that they add to various foods. And um, it's a European classification. If you look up E numbers, you can just run down the list and there's all kinds of things like a certain red dye and this, that, and the other things they might use to you know, color meat and stuff. So you, you want to get rid of those. And that was just a little diagram about how the luteolin works um, through the cell membrane down to, right down to the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. Other compulsive disorders, briefly, as we wind up here, um, light and shadow chasing I've had an interest in, and we're doing a study on the genetics of that at NIH um, with Dr. Ostrander again. Here they are, all the typical breeds. First time I ever saw a light chaser, it was an old English sheepdog. And the owner said, watch this. And she put a flashlight on the ground, and the dog started chasing and chasing and chasing it. And when you turn the flashlight off, he just kept chasing for you know, goodness knows how long afterwards. He was deaf. The next one I saw was no old English sheepdog and the next one, and they were all deaf. So I thought maybe dogs that are deaf have a predisposition. But I don't think that is true now because I've met so many dogs. We did one study on it for our website, um, a not-for-profit um, um, Center for Canine Behavior Studies. Um, on our studies, there's a little study that we published internally, and it really shows that it can be almost any breed. <clears throat> and no, they don't have to have been trained with a flashlight when they're young, um, and they, they're not necessarily deaf. So this is the kind of predatory behavior that's gone awry. Um, I don't know that humans do that, but they do engage in a lot of compulsive predatory behaviors, including things that some people would almost considered to be normal, like fishing. You know, some people will spend all kinds of money and all kinds of time at the expense of their family to go out hunting or fishing. And, and this is, you know, humans are predators too, the hunter-gatherers, the hunters. This is part of our legacy as former hunter-gatherers. Um, this tends not to cause injuries in the dog. Here's a picture, or actually a video, See a little flashlight on the ground.
they chase it. Sometimes they bump their nose on the ground. The worst I've ever seen with that is a dog who just bashed his nose on the ground. So I actually just had nosebleeds all the time. And there's a few other different ones. We've, you know, everybody's heard of dogs that chew rocks, sometimes swallow them and get intestinal obstruction. Um, eating things is something that dogs and people do. Um, you know, in some mental institutions, they have to be very careful of people who are like liable to eat, um, you know, non-food items. Um, I think my sister had a little bit of that. So she swallowed a one of these pins. I always call it a safety pin. When they X-rayed her, they said, "Don't worry, because it's going point down. You know, the sharp parts going backwards." And, and look at this. And there was all this other silver stuff, you know, silver paper and just and bits of things in her stomach. And they said, "You would just give them cotton wool sandwiches, and it'll probably pass." And it did. Um, digging. Everyone knows that dogs can become compulsive diggers, and they just will dig and dig and dig and dig anywhere they can find. I mean, all dogs might dig. This is all these behaviors are normal behaviors, but they're normal behaviors gone awry, performed to excess and out of context. And swimming, a picture on the bottom left. I've only seen one compulsive swimmer. It was in uh, New York area. Woman was very wealthy and she had this lovely big swimming pool. The dog would jump in the pool and it would swim lap after lap after lap after lap. It would swim seven hours at a time. If you got in the pool with the dog, it would nose you out. If you throw toys in the pool, it would throw them out. It just wanted to swim on its own. And here's another little video of a Doberman. And I said to you, they have object obsession. They called that dog the arranger, and he would arrange Beanie Babies and other toys in straight lines or crochet patterns or triangles. And you know that humans with OCD um, often will arrange things, um, and they like symmetry and patterns. You know, if you had a mantelpiece that had two candlesticks on the right-hand side, and somebody with that particular compulsion came in, they, they would probably space them out and have them even. So symmetry is another thing. Here's an avian form of OCD. So what did birds do? They do a lot of preening. So what would be the OCD that you'd expect to come out of that? Well, feather picking, which is an avian version of trichotillomania, otherwise known as hair pulling in humans. And yes, it's caused by stress, and it's so similar to the human equivalent of trichotillomania. Um, for example, not all human trichotillomaniacs do this, but a typical pattern would be they search for a particular hair, usually a, a, a new growth hair, and they pluck it out. And then they inspect it. And then they often just bite on the bulb of the hair. And then they discard it. The birds get their beak down where they can reach, which is in the chest region. They search for a new growth feather. They pluck it out. They look at it. They shred it sometimes so it looks like a brush. And then they discard it, only to start all over again. The result is, you know, feather loss or in humans, hair loss. It could be eyebrow pulling. It could be beard pulling in a man. Um, it could be pulling the hair out of your head, some women in particular, it's a female-oriented thing, um, they actually have to wear a wig because they put out so much hair that they can't go out in public. So everybody is doing it. Pigs, if you put them in confinement, okay, what's the trigger is stress. What do pigs do is they root. So they find something to root on and basically they do chain chewing and bar biting. So they're doing... There's very oral things with their snout. 
and a very eminent um, psychopharmacologist working for Solve uh, Pharmaceutical said in his view, pig OCD was the very best model of OCD to study. But he did say, however, they are very noisy and smelly. Um, they don't have to be because they're actually very clean animals, but it's the way we keep them. So they do it too. And actually these uh, guys, an experiment done by this guy, his name's uh, Berend Olivier in Holland, I think. Um, and he he treated the, eff the effect of pigs with um, fluvoxamine, which is a powerful um, SSRI, selective serotonin replication. And they responded like the dogs with the acral lick dermatitis in exactly the same way over exactly the same time as humans do. So really the same condition from species to species. And I don't think I have my horse slides here, but horses do it too. They call them stall vices. They chew the edge of the stall, um, sort of wood nibbling. They do funny biting movements on the stall, so-called cribbing or crib biting. Uh, they dig holes in the ground, talking about digging in dogs. Sometimes they're at, down to their shoulders in a hole they've dug in a, in a dirt floor. And they walk around in circles because walking is one of the things horses do naturally. So things to do with eating and walking and what you see in the horse, because those are their natural biological behaviors. Treatment in humans, you have cognitive therapy, which you don't really have in a dog. So the best thing we can do is environmental enrichment. We make sure they get plenty of exercise, make sure their environment's very interesting. But the one thing that's in common with dogs and humans is the anti-obsessional medication, which works really well. I would, would just add here that not all humans, not all dogs do respond that well. You know, let's say in round numbers, a third respond well, a third respond, okay, there's some improvement, and a third don't respond at all. So from our gene that we discovered in the dogs, we um, found out that that gene controls a neurotransmitter in the brain called glutamate through the NMDA receptor. It blocks the NMDA receptor, which effectively blocks glutamate. Glutamate is a very, well, probably the most important um, sort of go neurotransmitter. And from working on paperwork, we decided that if we gave an, an NMDA blocker that would be able to treat compulsive disorders in across the animal species and in humans. So we started the work in horses and it worked. We used dextromethorphan, which is um, an NMDA blocker. Um, we use various D isomers of opioids, which are NMDA blockers like D-methadone, and it blocked it in horses. We did it in dogs, and eventually we brought it down to the OCD clinic at Harvard Medical School. And they said, okay, we'll try it in some of our patients, but if you crazy vets are right, I'm going to eat my hat. Well, I wonder what the hat tasted like, because they're still using it today. And the last time I talked to the boss there, he said he's got about 200 patients on NMDA block to fortify the SSRI treatment. So if you don't respond that well to the SSRI, just like in the animals, you add an NMDA blocker. It's all the same. It's just one behavioral science, just like the four-chambered heart that translates from animal to animal to animal. I think snakes have a three-chambered heart, but for all the four-chambered heart animals, it's, which is most of the ones we talk about, the mammals, um, it's the same. And with the brain, it's the same. This is like ubiquity for the mind. The same mind, the same body, different proportions, you know, like a dog will have a larger olfactory lobe because they're, you know, in development, smelling became more important to them. So they're much better at smelling than us. They're much better at reading body language than us. We've got a bigger frontal cortex. We're much better at calculating and reasoning than they are. We feel the same pain. We feel the same anxiety through, for example, the amygdala um, and norepinephrine, same neurotransmitter. Same Grand Central Station of the amygdala, uh, things that light up on MRI, same reward centers, same pleasure centers, run by the same chemicals. So, I mean, basically, it's all the same.
So my conclusion is OCDs exist across the spectrum of animal species, including the human animal, because we are animals too, whether you like it or you don't. We're just the human. Was it? Desmond Morris called us the hairless ape. The genetic factors underlie the expression of these. It hasn't been completely worked out, but um, the gene we found was replicated in a different dog breed doing a different OCD in China and was actually found to be um, involved in humans in a study from Stellenbosch from South Africa. Uh, it tends to ride along with the anxious personality, which is one of the things in dogs that we see. And it's also in the human diagnostic manual that anxiety is, um, fuels this, at least is associated with it and probably fuels it. It can be triggered by environmental things. Um, it can cause self-injury in humans and in dogs and the treatments are reasonably effective and the same across the species. So I think I must have made the point that there isn't much difference between us and animals, either physically, which was the book about ubiquity, or mentally, which is what I've been talking about today. That was the book that I wrote and people made, the editor made me put in funny stories about me growing up and my two dogs, but I originally, when I wrote it, it was just the science, including generalized anxiety, including specific anxiety, including phobias, including PTSD, including the drugs that was used, um, lots of other behaviors that I haven't talked about today. But you have to go between the funny stories to get to the bits that I had originally wrote before they said, more fun stories, put more in, put more in. So there it is. Okay, so we're done. I'm going to open myself up to questions now. Thank you very much. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I have loads of questions, but we've got some questions in the chat. So I'll start with the questions for the chat. So we have uh, Jacqueline who says, thank you for interesting talk and is asking if human type medication can help dogs. Is the same true for helpful supplements? So like Lutolin, but other things, e.g. ashwagandha has been shown to, to have significant anti-anxiety effects in humans and aids regulation of cortisol. This will open up more options to help our animal companions. I'm not familiar with that particular thing, but the answer to the question is yes. And that um, numerous um, nutraceuticals um, that work to treat various things in humans will also work um, in dogs, including, you know, herbal remedies, you know, chamomile, for example, seems to reduce anxiety and also settle GI systems. We did a fair amount of work with a, a chemical called um, Huperzine A, H-U-P-E-R-Z-I-N-E hyphen capital A. Huperzine is derived from the Chinese club moss, I think it's Huperzia serrata. And it was being investigated down at Harvard Medical School as an anticonvulsant. And the head of uh, neurology there, a professor of neurology who specialized in epilepsy, said that Huperzine A was the most effective anticonvulsant he'd ever come across in his entire life. And in human medicine, it's also used um, to treat Alzheimer's. The mechanism was elucidated at Harvard that what it does is it increases acetylcholine in the brain and that suppresses the seizures. But also, when you think about it, one of the human drugs that can be very successful to treat Alzheimer's is a trade name in the States anyway, it's called Elderpril. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, no, it's, it's um, Ar Aricept. And Aricept um, also increases acetylcholine restores neurotransmission in that system. So Huperzine A is something that can be added to a diet that has an effect that would be the same as in humans. We did some work and I published one paper on that in the Journal of Neuro Neuro um, Epilepsy and Behavior. And there's numerous other things, but we've, we've done some big studies at the center um, and we didn't ask specifically what nutraceuticals or additives were employed, but it turns out that overall as a group, you know, herbal and um, other sort of ancillary, non-medically approved recipes were in fact uh, very successful in aggression and in fears and phobias. So 
there's a lot more to discover rather than just the old four on the floor drugs that we know about today. Mm. Thank you. Joe, I think you had a question and somebody's typing another question. Yeah, I do. Thank you so much. That was really interesting, um, Professor. Um, just a couple of questions. So one is that uh, regarding OCD uh, in animals and humans, with animals that are farmed, like you were talking about the pigs, you know, a lot of farmers uh, will put it down to boredom. And it's the way we're intent, especially in intensively farmed livestock, for example, um, without realising that the boredom then causes them the anxiety. So they'll perhaps look at higher welfare standards such as enrichment, but they won't actually then deal with the anxiety itself. So how is there a way we can actually encourage them, farm vets and farmers themselves and anyone, uh, those who have companion animals as well, who are bored and stabled or kept in kennels or whatever, to actually approach both problems. It's not just about environmental enrichment. It's not just about going for walks regularly. It's actually looking at treating the anxiety as well as the boredom. Uh, yeah, it's a chicken and egg uh, question, but it's the same you know, through all the animal species, and including humans. Um, you know, one animal example, which is cut across the board, is that there are certain compulsive disorders in cats. Um, this name one is psychogenic alopecia, where when they're in a stressful situation and they're anxious, they start to strip their hair out. So it's very similar to trichotillomania, um, an obsessive compulsive disorder. It's never been seen in cats that are not, that live outside. The, the disorders that occur in horses have never been seen in wild horses. Yeah. The disorders that you see in pigs have never been seen in wild pigs. They're all diseases of confinement. But here, it's the same with people. I went down to the human OCD clinic um, to sit in on a consultation with a psychiatrist. And he had a few people with trichotillomania came in. And after he'd finished his questions and monitoring their treatment with um, Paxil, I said, he said, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask the patient? And I said, yes, I did. I did have those questions. And there was one man sitting in front of me. He was a beard puller. Dink, dink, pulling out hairs in his beard. And I said, did this ever stop? You know, ever since you've had a beard, it's been going on. He said, well, actually, it did stop once. He said, I was, um, you know, I, w I work on the extension program at Harvard. And he said, um, I went, I would decide to do a big tour. I went hitchhiking in Canada. I went all across the country. And there I was with my backpack on and my billy can and lighting fires and putting up tents and guarding myself against predators and, you know, taking care and thinking about life. It's the, like the original human life. He's out there in the wild doing his thing, being a human. And it stopped. Yeah. He had real things to concern him instead of the imaginary. But it started up the minute he sat down at his computer desk. So Desmond Morris called the places that we live the concrete jungle. And when you're in the concrete jungle, and that's why I think as we live more and more in cities, we're seeing more and more of these psychological conditions arise. I met a woman, it was kind of embarrassing actually, in the same clinic. And they said, any questions you'd like to ask this woman? I said, um, when did yours start? And she said, well, it started shortly after I got married. And I thought, uh oh, she was, pulling hair out of her head. And I said, did it ever stop? She said, yes, I went on a, a boat cruise out of Boston, um, left her husband behind and went on this you know, four day, five day cruise, went down to the Caribbean and came back and said, the entire time I was away on this boat, I did not pull any hair out of my head. But on the way back, we we're about a, a couple of miles out of Boston Harbor and I started to pull again. So when you take away the stress, well, they, back to the animals, if I just use one example, is the horses. Um, I was aware of this when I, my father insisted I took riding lessons when he knew I was going to be a vet. So said, oh, you need to know how to ride a horse. I went along, but sitting on a rock, looking at the horses, they were all sitting there in these little cubicles, you know, eight by 12 by 15 or something like that, that nature. And okay, they threw in some hay and some grain. They ate it in about half an hour. And then they just stood there. And I would go home and have a rich life, talking to family, television, eating meals, and stuff like that. Um, 
go to bed, wake up, and I come back and the same horses in the same stall, doing nothing apart from waiting for breakfast, which you'd eat in half an hour. When you consider that against the life of a horse in the wild, where they spend about 60 or 70% of their time mm -hmm. grazing, um, it's what they're getting is not a patch on the real life. Yeah. So I point that out, say to horse owners, they go like, well, so what are you going to do? You can't turn them loose all the time. You know, I mean, even a, even a one acre, two acre, four acre field is not quite the same as being able to roam across the prairies, but it's an improvement. So they could not do the real thing because you can't have everything running around all over the place, least of all pigs um, down the highway. So you have to confine them. And the, the closer the confinement is, uh, the more severe the problem is. With humans, when you confine them because of psych psychiatric issues, or in prisons when they go into solitary. It's not a question of um, whether they go mad, it's just a question of when they go mad. It was a wonderful program by um, George Page, who is, I think he's passed away now, but he did a nature program called, about just called parrots. And they saw all these wonderful animals, colorful, flying around in the canopy. At the end of the show, there's a picture of one in a cage with his feathers all stripped off the front like the one I showed you and his beautiful narrating voice went and sadly in captivity some of these beautiful creatures go completely mad so the best we can do is to and you have to fight the egg business you know more space less confinement enrichment um things to eat um maybe on a if, if they eat all the time like a horse maybe the food could be coming out through some kind of dispenser so they're not just confined to meal times which are okay for us, us but not okay for a horse you have to try and conform to nature as closely as you can Absolutely. while still maintaining some sort of civil it's about, it's about letting them exhibit their natural behavior and have choices isn't it i think which is the same with with humans and animals once we can do that and deal with the anxiety and the boredom it, it all correlates i think thank you i have got a couple of other questions but i'm going to pass it back to eva and those others on the chat because i might just be cheeky and send you an email about some of the other things uh, yeah. professor so i'll pass back to eva thank actually you. building on and please anybody else do type in your question into the chat, but building on this one, it, because that's, it's, I think it's quite an interesting concept in itself, because you have obviously mentioned that some of the, um, some of the conditions there are actually genetic precursors to these, but whether they sort of evolve or not is um, obviously then linked to the environment as well. So would you say, I mean, with some of the conditions as well. So if you have, if as you said, with the both the autistic uh, children and the dogs, you find that the neurotensin levels were increased. Is there any sort of, and obviously some some of the conditions, whatever enrichments there are going to be, if, if the condition is there, is not always going to be just about the environment it will develop, it's just that the predisposition and some of them, maybe the milder versions can be for the, Neurotensin, is there any specific program that is looking at the developing an inhibitor for that to, as a potential treatment for both, obviously, the human animal and the non-human animal? Do you know? Well, I do know that um, if you, you know, Dr. Olivier's work, and I think this applies to, um, with pigs, um, is that you could take, you know, let's say, a barn full of 100 confined pigs in exactly the same situation of anxiety, same building, same feeding regime, same cleaning out regime, everything's the same. Only 20% develop the OCD. But you're right, Eva, that it is a gene environment interaction. So if you don't have the genetic predisposition, you might feel anxious, but you're not going to express it in the hmm. OCD way. So not everyone's going to show it. And it's the same with PTSD, for example, you know, that soldiers going to war, some of them are resilient and they can see the same horrible things and they go multiple tours and nothing happens because they don't have the genetic predisposition. Of course, Donald Trump says the people who show it are weak, but it's because he didn't understand anything. Um, 
but you know it's you need both and that, that's what makes it difficult to study that it is as you say it's a gene environment interaction and if you have the gene but the environment is optimized you may never express it which is why you would never see it in nature but if you don't have the gene um, it doesn't matter how stressed you are that's not the way that you're going to express your internal anxiety i don't know whether i answered your question properly no no that's a that's a, i think that's a, exactly the sort of thing that i was talking about and it is, I think, is an interesting combination in terms of what we what can be done in general for people, but also obviously for the companion animals and for the animals that we keep. So mm -hmm. obviously, we're not going to we're not going to individually. Maybe sometime in the future, as the sort of as the Chris method is becoming a, a streamlined and more accessible. But right now, we will not be able to all be sitting at home to be testing our companion animals for any genetic predispositions. Mm -hmm. But it will well, be. Just, just may I interrupt there? You made an important point, and I forgot to mention with the cats. Yeah, the indoor cat, which is the safest way to keep a cat, because outside there's all kinds of horrible things that happen from predators and traffic and fights with other cats and getting bitten and diseases. And so it's, it's, they live much longer, safer, ha happier lives if they're indoors. But if you don't want compulsive disorders to develop, in a cat that's sort of genetically prone to them, and we have a study going on in that right now. Um, you need, and I think this is really important for all cat owners to know, you need to provide for the cat. They're not just a furry body that lies around on the bed all day long and eats and you pet, pet it occasionally and it purrs. They need to have things arranged in the house that are things that they, they would normally do in life. So cats are a three-dimensional species. They like to go up in high places. So at the very least a cat condo um, in some cases, a friend of mine, the cat whisperer, is trying to solve a problem, in, and he's very good, I think, and he had a, a walkway put up to the uh, the um, plate rail around the house, and the cat could go up and walk around close to the ceiling, or they need a window perch, they need to be able to look out, and you can fit bird feeders, and you need to exercise them, you can drag little toys around on a string, um, you can safely use a flashlight, a uh, so-called laser mouse. You can have puzzle toys. You can spend more time interacting with them, making sure they get exercise. You need, if you're not going to take away the big outdoors, you have to replace it with something else that's closer to their natural behavior. Yes, and I think that sort of fits quite well with what I was saying as well, because we won't be, we can't all test our animals for genetic predisposition, but we can do quite a lot to avoid some of the some of the problems that can arise if we don't provide proper proper enrichment and well you, you might be able to in the future because for example if you just take the one gene that we found so far actually there's probably two or three but um, some serotonin genes too we found but if you take that cdh2 gene it wouldn't take very much to develop um, a genetic test so that you could test they say breeding doberman pair you know both the sire and the bitch you could test them both to see if they had that gene with a, say, a mouth swab. It's not like doing a whole genome assay, just like 23 me type thing. You just do this, send it off, it'll cost 40 bucks. Um, um, what's that? 30 pounds. Um, and for that test, you could test the breeding pair. And then you know that you've got sound offspring. And that could apply to you know, any disease where the genetics are found out. They've got more knowledge about what happens in humans than we have in animals, but we're getting there. You know, there's a lot of people working on it right now. Yes, that's quite an interesting proposition for the breeding for going forward to try and avoid some of some of the some of the conditions. And of course the dogs in themselves are quite a closed population as far as genes are concerned. Mm -hmm. So it would uh, have a huge impact if that started to if that started to take effect. That's uh, it's an interesting suggestion. Okay, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to Joe. I don't know if you want to ask one more question before we yeah, wrap up. 
if you wouldn't mind, and I'll try and be as quick as I can. So regarding One Medicine, I mean, what you've spoken about, Professor, is exemplifies what One Medicine is. You know, this is humans and animals suffer from similar conditions, from neurochemistry, psychologically, psychological conditions, and the treatments can be very similar as well. So perfect example of what One Medicine is. But, you know, we are struggling um, in certain areas, and this is one of those fields, to really get that data and really be able to get share that data and get the vets and the doctors, human and animal medical professionals together to share this knowledge. Do you have any tips on how we can do that? Well, it's uh, very difficult. Usually from when people realize something, you know, whether it's a new treatment or a new concept or a new idea, however hard you work at putting the word out through social media, talking at meetings, publishing papers, it's usually about 20 years before the penny drops. And, you know, I think what's happening now is we're working hard towards it. I mean, take 20 years ago, a lot of people were, you know, vets and owners were incredulous about the use of Prozac, fluoxetine, in animals. Mm -hmm. Now, most vets are very happy to prescribe it, but it took 20 years. You know, they, another drug that came along was trazodone, and it was unknown um, until about 15 years ago, and now, you know, almost all vet, vets use it. They don't understand it well enough to be able to sort of play tunes on it. Um, you know, you, you need to... It's not just as simple as one milligram per kilogram body weight will treat a dog. Um, sometimes you have to reduce the dose because there are side effects. Sometimes you have to increase the dose because there aren't. It's not having the effect you want. And sometimes you've got to modify the, the combination. It's a little bit complicated, but they've, they've got the idea now with those two drugs and some others are catching up too. And people have some knowledge of buspirone and they're beginning to understand about clonidine. I'll give it another 10 years. Everybody will be on board with everything. And, it's just a slow process, and uh, I mean, a lot of lot has happened from the days when, when I joined Tufts in, well, actually even further back than that. Shortly after I graduated from Glasgow University, um, I went to a talk was given by a very famous anesthesiologist, and I asked him whether he thought animals felt pain, and he sounded a bit haughty to start with, and said, "Well." Pain is a subjective moiety that is um, interpreted in the um, higher centers and requires interpretation. Um, and I'm not convinced that animals are capable of that. And he said, however, I have two wonderful Labradors. And if they have anything done to them, just because I'm not completely sure that they're pain free, I always make sure they're treated with you know, analgesics and the proper you know, local anesthetics and whatever. So he was ready. He, he, he was an you know, important man. He just was not quite on the point of understanding it. I had a tough time at the beginning of Tufts to persuade um, the surgeons that they should be doing pain relief. Um, and now we're a pain relief center. We've got a, a, you know, a pain clinic. Um, but there were surgeons and other people who just didn't, didn't accept it. I remember the professor of cardiology, I met him one time, he said, oh, you're rushing off, where are you going to? I said, I'm going to do an interview on animal emotions with this radio show. And he said, oh, don't be stupid. You know, everybody knows they're just automatons. You know, they, they, and I, I'm like, what? Why, why were you a veterinarian? Why, why didn't you just become a plumber? Um, it, it, it is, it, it is quite um, scary some of these concepts and sadly they still are there and obviously we, we will carry on trying to get people on board for one medicine and it will be hopefully in few in not so distant future it will be like those medics that you mentioned at Harvard that had to eat their heads having used the ENMDA <laughs> drugs and uh, we will we will carry on trying to persuade people that, that there is a lot of benefit on knowledge sharing and learning from each other and working together and accepting the fact that animals are quite similar to us and naturally occurring disease and uh, lots of the issues that uh, we as humans encounter, they encounter as well. And then 
we won't be giving up and we will carry on carrying the message forward so thank you very much it has been it has been really really informative and i'm looking forward to looking up some of the additional references that you mentioned during the talk and thank you to everybody who's attended and i hope those will, who will join the recorded session will enjoy it as much as we have so thank you very much and thank have you. a lovely day and a lovely afternoon thank you thank you Eva. carry thank on you pushing much. that heavy rock up the hill because you will get to the top we will make it just we like will. Sisyphus, we will persist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.